Good evening, good evening, everyone. Happy holidays, and guess what? We're coming to the end of a whole nother year. Hallelujah. We, Christ has brought us through five more days before the end of 2019, and of course, the season of 2020 will begin. Um, great expectations for a new year, great expectations for what God is going to do. But tonight, uh, we're going to be dealing with some uh, issue and still reflective on the heart. Oh, I haven't forgotten about the heart. I know I haven't been on Tea Talk Thursdays in a while. You know, sometimes you have other pressing things that God wants you to take up. And plus, you know, you have to sit in the presence of the Lord in order to get other information and direction from God. So tonight... Um, I just want to thank you for tuning in. Do me a favor and please share, 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 invite your followers. I look so forward to um, sharing tonight with each and every one of you. Um, let us just open up with prayer. We're going to dive into this topic because it's a topic that God has shared with me um, during this, in the absence of the Tea Talk Thursdays, um, dealing with the bitter heart. And so before we go into it, let us just bow our heads in prayer and come into agreement. Father, we thank you and we bless you and we exalt your name right now. We give you all the praise and the honor that's due rightfully unto your name. Lord, we lift our hearts unto you, Lord God. We ask, Father, that you just examine us, Lord God. And if you find anything in our hearts that does not resemble you, any emotion, any guilt, any um, bitterness that's in our heart, Father, we lift that bitterness up to you, Lord God. We ask that you pluck out every root of, of, of discontentment, every root of anger and bitterness that could reside in our heart and go deeper into our soil of our souls, Lord God, so that we will not be able to bear forth the fruit that you have caused us to do. We're entering into, Lord God, a new year, and we need to enter into this year with a clean heart, Lord God. We need to have a clean heart so that we can be acceptable and pleasing in your sight. We need to come out of 2019, Lord God, not just with gifts and presents and new clothing, perfume, shoes. We need to come out Lord God, spiritually equipped with a clean heart, a clean slate with you, O Lord God. So we ask you forgive us of our sins and our shortcomings, anything we may have said, done, or thought that's not like you. Lord God, we even bind that, that you will continue to create in us a clean heart and that you will bind the hands of the enemy that would keep us from make keeping us from clearing out those areas that might be con that might be attached to us that would try to sneak its way into 2020. Any type of unforgiveness, any type of malice, strife, or jealousy, envy, Lord God, any resentment or anger, any one, Lord God, that we have as a root in our hearts, Lord God, we ask that you reveal it even on tonight, even as they sleep through the night. But don't let 2019 end, Lord God, without you dealing with our hearts. And we thank you and we praise you, Lord God, even now in Jesus' name we pray. Amen, amen, amen. The heart is so, so important to God. And we overlook it. We bypass it We because we don't understand it. And because we don't understand it, we get tricked by the enemy into thinking that we have this good heart. You know, we do good deeds and we get deceived by the good deed that we do that that makes us have a good heart. That was a good action, but does it make our heart clean? Not necessarily because the motive is what drives the purpose behind what we do. And so we have to not just do things, but we have to do things with a clean heart and a good motive. Amen. So we need to definitely do that. So tonight we will be dealing with the bitter heart the bitter heart. And the reason why I'm on this topic is because God told me that a lot of his children are bitter or they're becoming bitter. They're mad with him based upon things they thought that he should have done or handled another way, but has yet to do it the way that they thought how. It's important for you right now to share this broadcast with your friends. Create your watch parties, create, send it to your relatives, send it to your uh, Facebook friends, Instagram friends, because this is our end of the year 
Tea Talk Thursdays, and we want to make sure that we give you the word of the Lord and what God is commissioning his children to do is to exit out of this year, ensuring that their hearts are anchored and clean with him because that's what matters most. No matter what we have planned, how much food we've eaten, I know a lot of us are still eating over left eating leftovers from yesterday and Christmas has passed and returns took place today and we're making great New Year's plan. But in all of that planning, all of that excitement and all of that, we got to make sure that our heart is clean and acceptable in the sight of God. So let us dive into the bitter heart. So the bitter heart is normally a unresolved, unforgiven anger or resentment. It is the result of anger changing from an experience to a belief, okay? Bitterness is seething and constant. Bitter people normally carry the same uh -huh. burden as angry people do. Now, most people don't know that, that angry people and bitter people carry the same burden, but to a greater extent is bitterness. Hey, what's up, Kelly? Wave, wave, wave. How are you doing, love? Please share, share, share. Glad to see you. When you are offended or disappointed by others and you allow the hurt to germinate in your heart, then your heart and can produce bitterness and resentment has an opportunity to take root. Okay, So whenever we're offended or we are disappointed by others, we allow the hurt to germinate in our heart and bitterness and, re and resentment can take root. So it is very important that we don't let the root of bitterness take a root in our heart. And most of the time, it is characterized by an unforgiving spirit or generally negative critical attitude. Bitterness and resentment are sinful and self-defeating. So when you allow that um, anger and you allow that disappointment or that offense to begin to germinate in your heart, it, it partners with the unforgiving spirit and it generates a negative critical attitude and then bitterness and resent, resentment set in. They are very sinful and they are self-defeating. So we know that bitterness and resentment are what? Sinful and self-defeating. They will color our consciousness and our unconscious thoughts and actions. They are allowed, if they are allowed to fester, they will destroy and they will kill. However, there's only one way to dispel this bitter root and that is with love. So in order to get that bitter root out, it has to come through love and love is not just, I love you. It has to be an action Christ is the example of love, the sacrifice that he made. It's a letting go of what is inside of our heart. So let's look at some scripture because you know I'm big on scripture. So let's look at some scripture that surrounds this. We're going to look at Hebrews 12, 14 and 15, where it states, many make effort to live in, make every effort to live in peace with all men and be holy. Without holiness, no one will see the Lord. So to it that no one misses the grace of God, that no bitter root grow up to cause trouble and defile many. So in order to live peacefully with all men and to be holy, because without holiness, no one sees the Lord. Now you've heard that scripture. Without holiness, no one sees the Lord. See to it that, here's the second part that's important to that. See to it that no one misses the grace of God and that no bitter root grows up to cause trouble and defile many. Okay? And, and that many, because bitterness is a root that doesn't only affect you, it'll affect anyone and everyone around you. Ephesians 4, 31 and 32 says, Get rid of all bitterness rage and anger, brawling and slander, along with every form of malice. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other just as Christ has forgiven you. So you see here how, again, I mentioned that the unforgiving spirit 
couples with bitterness because forgiveness is important to the release of that bitterness. Because once you're offended and once you're disappointed, bitterness starts to form in it if we let it germinate, set root, continue to fester in our heart. Going on to 1 Peter 2 and 23. When they hurled their insert when they hurled their insults at God, he did not retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threats. Instead, he entrusted himself to him who judges justly. So at this point, for all of us, including me at point where we feel the need to retaliate, we shouldn't. What did he do? He suffered. When we uh when they made threats and they uh, uh, insulted him, what did he do? He entrusted himself to whom? The, the real judge, who is, who is God and God alone. Jesus says in Luke 23, 24, Jesus said, forgive them for they know not what they're doing. Then we go on to Matthew 6, 14 and 15. For if you forgive man when they sin against you, your heavenly father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their sins, your father will not forgive your sins. You know, forgiveness is not to be taken lightly. It's not just a bunch of words you say. That stuff has to come from a heart posture. You have to have the heart to really forgive whoever has offended you and who has disappointed you because failure to do so, as I stated early, it will, thank you, Kelly, for sharing, it will fester into your heart. It will germinate into your heart. And that bitter root starts coming in. Then he goes on to Romans 12 and 14. He says, blessed, those, blessed are those who persecute you. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Mourn with those who mourn. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be proud, but be willing to associate with people of low posture. Do not be conceited. Do not repay anyone evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everybody. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Do not take revenge, my friends, but leave room for God's wrath. For it is written, it is mine to avenge. avenge. I will repay, saith the Lord. On the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him something to drink. In doing so, you are heaping coals of fire on his head. But do not do overcome evil, but overcome evil by doing good. So we don't overcome evil by doing evil. We overcome it by doing good. So we have to watch out that no bitter root of unbelief rises up among us. For whatever it springs up, many are corrupt by his poison. Hebrews 12 and 14. So we got to watch out that no bitter root of unbelief rises up among us. For whatever springs up, many, many, many are corrupted by its poison. Okay? So if we're not careful and we let that disappointment and we let that bitterness and we let that bitterness and resentment take a root. It's not just going to poison you. It's going to poison others. And we see that in the body of Christ very heavily where people are disappointed by a church leader or they're disappointed by a church member or they're disappointed by a friend, a spouse, or a loved one. And you see this, that all of a sudden they become man bashers and leader bashers and they want to just, you know, they want to leave sourness in your belly so that you too can become what? Bitterness. They want that poison to seep inside of you because they're angry and that bitterness. And remember, angry and bitterness kind of mirror each other. So they kind of have the same problems and the same issues, but bitterness is a step above anger. Okay? It's a step above anger. So I'm going to say this. Bitterness does not only affect you. It affects everyone with whom you come in contact with. That is why we must examine our hearts and say, Lord, is there any root of bitterness in my heart against anybody? 
Is there anything I am holding that I've tucked, that I've allowed that root to go deep down and germinate over years? Maybe I'm still disappointed about something and still um, um, offended by someone and we haven't let it go. You know how we have a tendency to sweep things under a rug and because it's under the rug, we think it's... We, it's dealt with and we don't go back and check under that rug or try to get the pile away because we want to consider it gone out of sight out of mind no it's still underneath the rug and god is going to start yanking back some of these rugs before this year ends okay that you can that those roots and those bitterness and those hidden things that you think are gone can be revealed so that you can deal with them and ask God for forgiveness and forgive those who have trespassed against you. Like God is our example. He has forgiven us. Amen. So when we look at the book of Ruth, and I know most of us know the story of Ruth and Naomi. And we know that Naomi was uh, Ruth. Uh, the wife of Emelec took his wife and his two sons down to Bethlehem to the country of Moab because there was a famine in the land. And while there, the two sons took uh, wives named Ruth and Oprah and among, from among the native people. Uh, Emelec and his two sons died in Moab and left Ruth, Naomi, and Oprah to fend for themselves. When the news came that the famine in the land of Judah had lifted, Naomi decided to go back to her own people. And the three women set out together. But on the way, Naomi offered the two young women an opportunity to be free to go and return home to their own people. No, they said, we want to go with, with you to your people. But Ruth replied, why would you go with me? Can I still give birth to other sons who um, could grow up to be your husband? No, my daughters, return to your parents' home, for I am too old to marry again. And even if it was possible, and I were to get married tonight and bear sons, then what? Would you wait for them to grow up and refuse to marry someone else? No, of course not, my daughters. These are far more bitter. Things are far more bitter for me than for you, because the Lord himself has caused me to suffer. That's Ruth 1, 10 and 15. I'm going to zip through because it is a little bit of a long story. But I want to focus on the fact that she said, these things are far more bitter for me than for you because the Lord himself has caused me to suffer. Okay. Why did Ruth change her name? When they came to Bethlehem, the whole town was stirred by their arrival. Is it Naomi, they said, and she said, don't call me Naomi. She told them, instead, call me Mara. Mara means bitter. For the Almighty God has made life very bitter for me. I went away full, she says, but the Lord has brought me home empty. Why should you call me Naomi? And Naomi meant pleasant when the Lord has caused me to suffer. And the Almighty has sent such tragedy. Here she changed the name to Mara. She went from Naomi, meaning pleasant, to Mara, being bitter. Being what? She was bitter. That's what Mara means. She had some things come in her life that caused her to suffer. And what was a once pleasant woman now became a bitter woman. It's that easy to go from pleasant to bitterness just because of life's trials and situations that can come what do you suppose it was that caused the whole town to stir? could it have been naomi's appearance do you ever stop to think that they could see the change that has taken place inside her heart on her face how many of you have gone someplace that you've known someone for years and you come back years later and look at them it's like Oh my God, so much has changed. They don't look as happy. Their face and their whole body looks 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 like disappointment and 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 
offense has taken its root. Do you know when you carry those things, it takes on a look in your physical appearance. You begin to look at just like depression. Depression has a look. You can be depressed and start wearing it. I always tell people we wear what we are. We wear outwardly how we're feeling. When we feel beautiful, we feel loved. That shows in how we carry ourselves. It shows in our attitude. It shows in our character. It shows in, in, in our nature, okay? But this here, we have a woman who was once pleasant. She didn't leave that way, but she came back, what, depressed. She said, things are far better for me than for you. But the Lord himself has caused me to suffer and call me Mara for the almighty God made life very bitter for me. She says she went away full and came back empty. Naomi blamed God for making her life bitter and empty. All she could see was what she no longer had. And that was what she loved. Her bitterness reflected a heart of unbelief in the justice and the sovereignty of God. She held on to the anger for what had been done to her and stood in judgment over God. In the entire text, we see nothing of Naomi's quest to understand the purpose of God in her suffering. We only read that she was angry and bitter for what she had lost. We must understand the, the, the purpose of God in our suffering. And sometimes we don't know why we go through what we go through. But instead of getting bitter, we need to fast and we need to continue being in the presence of the Lord to find out, Lord, why must these things be? We must come into agreement even when we don't understand. See, the enemy wants us to be angry. He wants us to be bitter at God. He wants to hold anger and bitterness and resentment because he knows that bitter root of judgment that goes down inside of our spirit man is going to come up and cause not just us to be a mess, but we're going to mess up the lives of others. So this is how we get that church hurt, hurt people, hurting people, because we don't deal with that hurt and we don't deal with that pain. We figure if we avoid it, it'll go away or we can just swallow it and it will disappear. If we pretend it's not there, then it won't be there. No, it's not Casper the Friendly Ghost. It is there to damage you. It is there to, to cause you to do what? Bring up and ruin other people's lives, not just yours. Now, perhaps you struggle with some type of business. Sometimes women and men who have lost children to illness or accidents blame God for their loss. God, how could you take my beloved child from me? Do you not know how much I loved him and how could you do this to me? Look, I am no stranger to the loss of a child, okay? In 2009, my son was shot and killed. I had a choice to become bitter and angry and resentful to God. I don't understand why God allowed it, but I wouldn't have understood it if I, at the time, all I know is that God is justice is good. His no is good. Everything about God is good. I could be angry and bitter with God with resentment, and I could want to be the opposite of Job and want to curse God and blame this thing that God ain't real and all of this stuff. I can turn my heart away from God. I can go through the forms of church just to have to go, but in my heart, I still have lodged in there that bitterness. We have got to begin to um, allow God to clear us from that bitterness. We have got to do that. Okay, suppose you had an abandoned spouse may become bitter as they wonder, God, did. do you see how much I'm struggling to raise these kids while he's out there living the high life? You know, we have marriages where the, the wife is home and she's trying to raise the kid and the husband is not as supportive or helpful. He's out there doing it and doing it and doing it well. He's out there doing it, right? How can we, how could God just let him get away with this? Oh, let me raise my hand here because I've had that type of husband. While I was home raising the kids, he was out there living the high life. And I couldn't understand then 
How did God let him get away with this? And I'm, I'm the one here who's being faithful. And now I'm the one that's miserable because this is what has been allowed. And you start to think, do God care about me? Then if he did, why are you punishing me? That's how it could be. There are many people who don't understand why God is allowed certain things. And they feel punished. And I remember what God said to me in this situation. He said, that marriage wasn't about just you and him being married. It was about building you. Sometimes God chooses, I call him unique utensils of life to help build us to where he needs us to be. Okay. Then you got, say for instance, there's an honest businessman. He sees a crooked businessman prospering while he's while he flounders. God, how can you stand by and let this happen? I'm an honest businessman, my but my business is failing. How can you just let him get away with such thievery? I have a wife and kids to feed. God, why are you doing this to me? Okay. We all have these questions about why God, come on, we, we're in the world. Do we not see sometimes the wicked, it looks like the wicked is getting more than the children of the church? That sometimes we see the wrong that others do and we're sitting here tr trudging in, you know, you know, trying to live right, do right, obey the Lord, seek his face. We try to do all of that and all of a sudden, all of a sudden, here comes God. Okay, and God is doing nothing, and it seems like the wicked, the wicked is prospering. And here we are in the church, and we are not prospering the way we think that we should be. And yet, here comes the enemy planting seeds, okay, seeds of doubt, seeds of, of confusion, seeds of resentment and, and harboring of things into our heart. We have to get out that bitterness and that resentment from god so you can have a childless couple and they're bitter when they see families with several kids and they cannot seem to have one god why don't you let me have even one child when others other people have children it's unfair sometimes you see children being aborted and abandoned and here you are a loving woman and a loving man trying to have a family and you can't and then you see this and we see it every day i work for the school system and i see it every single day children neglected children um, malnourished children not taken care of and yet i know people that can't have any and you're looking like well god why are you doing this to us? We, you can become bitter out of, a res, uh, out of a belief that God will not punish the people who hurt you, that God does not hear your plea, or that he does not care about your plight. That is not true, okay? As I stated before, some of these situations I've said to you, except for the childless couple, I've been in. I've been in these situations and I can become bitter, I can become resentment, but I refuse to let that bitter root take down in my in my soil of my heart so that it winds up hurting and, and discouraging and, and causing pain to other people. We have to choose to have a clean heart. We have to choose to seek the Lord for those things that we do not understand. Some, we don't. We always ask, why do good things, bad things happen to good people? Okay? That's another topic, and we'll discuss that at another time. But it does, sit, and, and it does seem that way sometimes. It does appear that way to us when we think that we are doing all that we can right, and yet we see the wicked prosper, or we see the uh, unjust and the unfaithful and the unloyal come in, and they end up... Um, um, prospering ahead of us, you know, so we since God is is apparently sometimes we feel that since God is apparently not going to intervene in our circumstances, we we start to stand in as a judge and a jury and an executor in the lives of other people. So when we don't see God moving, we take matters into our own hand. We begin to step in and we begin to be the judge of it and we begin to be the jury of it and then we begin to be hey Ercy, how are you baby thank you for tuning in and then we begin 
to be the executors in the lives of other people. That's how we become judge and jury, you know, because we're bitter. Maybe our marriage hasn't worked out. Maybe we didn't marry the right spouse. Maybe we didn't get what we thought we deserved. Or maybe something tragic happened in our lives and, and the enemy sets in and we got uh, unforgiveness and offense in the way. You know, we got to get rid of that. You know, we got to get rid of that. So we have to end 2019 with a clean heart. So we need God to say, hey, examine my heart, Lord, because only God knows what's really tucked in it. The heart is like the carpet. We like to sweep things under and pretend they don't exist anymore. But meanwhile, there's a pile underneath there and there's a big lump in the in the carpet that we walk around and we just don't address. We have to. It becomes a circular pattern. The more we dwell on what has has been done to us, the injustices that we have suffered or the loss that we have occurred, the deeper goes the root of bitterness. That's our topic, the bitter heart. You know, the more we do circle, it's like a circle, like a circle pattern. The more we dwell on what has been done to her, us and the injustices we have suffered and the loss that we have occurred, the deeper goes the root of bitterness. You already know what's carrying around a load of bitterness is, it's exhausting. If you keep carrying that bitterness, you're going to feel heavy. You're going to feel weighted. And so we be get exhausted carrying that stuff around. It is so much easier to be free than it is to be heavy and um, to be bound. Bitterness hardens our hearts on the inside and the features on the outside. So we begin to look exactly what we wear. So what you wear on the inside, how you feel on the inside shows up on the outside. Okay, if you feel ugly, guess what you're going to look? And it's not that you are. It's just that you're going to start to make your appearance ugly to fit what you feel about yourself. So whatever's going on on the inside of you, you begin to put on a natural garment too. Amen. So bitterness hardens your heart and it can become contagious. It is very contagious. You ever talk to a bitter person? They could be negative, critical attitudes, all of that. And that stuff begins to what? Catch on to you. Next thing you know, you're talking negative and you 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 you're you're talking bitter. Okay, and then you're focusing on the things that have happened to you and you're just dwelling on your injustice and you're thinking about all the loss you incurred and now your bitter root is, is springing up and it's starting to get buried into your heart. Okay, but bitterness is usually, like I said before, is associated with anger and grudges. Do you have any grudges? Are you angry with someone? Is there some things you haven't let go of? Be honest. Don't lie to yourself. The worst thing you can do is lie to yourself. You can't lie to God, but you can lie to you. You can say to yourself, look, I ain't got no issues. It's everybody else. It ain't me. No, it's me or me, oh Lord, that stands in the need of change. Not my brother, not my sister, not my mother. It is me. I have to look at me. Look at the man in the mirror, the woman in the mirror. Okay, and then begin to say, Lord, I need a clean heart. I stress that all the time. I pray that all the time over myself, creating me, Lord, a clean heart. Renew within me a right spirit because I want to be wholly acceptable and pleasing in your sight. Amen. Bitterness, as I said, is normally associated with anger and grudges, but it is what, but is that what it means in Hebrews 12 and 15? So, to it that no one fails to obtain the grace of God, that no bitter root of no root of bitterness spring up and cause trouble. By it many become defiled. No. Let's ask the question. Does the root of bitterness mean that the root is bitterness, like a block of wood? Or does it mean that the root grows up into a plant and bears the bitter fruit? Does bitterness in Hebrew 12, 15 means festering anger? Or does it mean poisonous and foul? The third question is, where, where did this image of the bitter root come from? So these are three things. Let's start with the last question. 
And we're going to answer it in Deuteronomy 29, 18. Beware lest there be among you a man or a woman, a clan or tribe, whose heart is turning away today from the Lord, our God, to go and serve the gods of these nations. Beware lest there be among you a root bearing poisonous and bitter fruit. Now, this background is what I use to help us understand the first two questions. The root is not itself bitterness, but rather bears the fruit of it. You know, when we began Tea Talk Thursday, we began by understanding that we know a tree by the fruit that it bears. We began understanding how tea was produced. We began with that. And one of the things I love about God is how he ties everything into a nice, neat, neat package because we talk about the fruit that comes upon a tree. Okay. And he says here that it's not bitterness, but rather bears the fruit of bitterness. And the bitterness it bears is sometime uh, is something poisonous. So if you eat a, uh, what's the story where they had the apple? What was the fairy tale? Uh, uh, was it Snow White? Was it Snow White? And the, the, the evil witch or whatever she was, she presented an apple and it was poisonous. And she bit into the apple, okay? So that was a fruit. A bitterness it was poisonous okay that's what we do okay the bitter fruit make is not going to fester just anger and it says here that um the bitter fruit is to sprout it sprouts up it's a fruit that comes into our life we we begin to adopt that fruit of nature that fruit on our tree and everything on that tree is poison anyone who comes near us and eats of our tree eats that poison that we spread through conversation, through um, um, words, okay, through actions or deeds. That's how that, that fruit poisons the many that is around us. The, question, the key question is this, what is that root that causes deadly bitter fruit to sprout in the church? Now, here we go. I'm talking about the church now. The next verse is Deuteronomy next verse in Deuteronomy 29 gives that surprising answer but it fits perfectly with the book of Hebrews as well. So Deuteronomy 29:18 ends this. Beware lest there be among you a root bearing poisonous and bitter fruit. Then verse 19 begins by defining this fruit. It says one who when he hears the words of his sworn covenant blesses himself in his heart saying i shall be safe then though i walk in the stubbornness of my heart this will lead to the sweeping away of moist and dry alike i'll say it again one who when he hears the words of a sworn covenant blesses himself in his heart saying, I shall be safe, though I walk in the stubbornness mm, whew, of my heart. Ah, yes. Mm. This will lead to the sweeping away of moist and dry alike. Mm. When this is the root that brings forth, what is the root that brings forth the bitter fruit? It is a person who has a wrong view of eternal security. He feels secure or she feels secure when he or she is not secure. They say, I shall be safe, secure, though I walk in the stubbornness of my own heart. They misunderstand the covenant God makes. Because they think because he is a part of a covenant people, he is secure from God's judgment. None of us are secure from God's judgment. I don't care who we're in relationship in the church or who, what position we play. None of us are safe from God's judgment. This kind of presumption is what the book of Hebrew deals with repeatedly, professing 
Christians who think they are secure because of some past spiritual relationship or some present association with Christian people or their acts of what they do. The aim of Hebrew is to cure Christians of presumptions and to cultivate earnest perseverance in faith and holiness. At least four times it warns that we must not neglect our greatest salvation, but be vigilant to fight the fight of faith every day, lest we become hardened and fall away and prove that we had no share in Christ. Hebrews 2 and 3, 3, 12 and 14, Hebrews 6, 4 and 7, Hebrews 10, 23 and 20, 29. This is also the very point of the context of the term root of bitterness in Hebrews 12 and 15. We must strive for peace with everyone and for the holiness without which no one, let me make that clear, without holiness, say it with me, no one will see the Lord. See to it that no one fails to obtain the grace of God, that no root of bitterness springs up and causes trouble, and by it, many become defiled. This is a warning not to treat holiness lightly or to presume upon more grace. Therefore, a root of bitterness is a person or a doctrine in the church which encourages people to act presumptuously and treat salvation as an automatic thing that does not require a life of vigilance in the light in the fight of faith and the pursuit of holiness such a person or a doctrine defiles many and can lead to the experience of an esau who played fast and loose with his inheritance and could not repent in the end and find life it could lead to saul's spirit whose stubbornness caused to him to choose his own philosophies of thoughts over being obedient to what God instructed him to do. How often do we alter the plans of God to fit our own vain imaginations? You, we need to be careful that we do not treat holiness lightly or to presume upon more grace, okay? Therefore, a bitter root of bitterness, I'm going to say it again, is a person and doctrine in the church which encourages people to act presumptuously and treat salvation as an automatic thing that does not require a life of vigilance in the fight of faith and the pursuit of holiness without holiness. You will one and no one will see the Lord. See, that's what Hebrews is about. It's what the cure and it leads us into learning about righteousness and holiness, which is what people don't talk about anymore. We don't talk about be, living holy. We want to talk, have conversations that will draw in the masses and make everybody feel warm and gucci gucci and make them feel good and leave out and their lives are still as raggedy as they left in. There's no conviction. There's no altar calls. There's nothing there that should, that should bring you to the repentance part so that the heart can be clean and the issues can be dealt with. Okay. We have to want the cure for bitterness. You have to want to be cured of bitterness. You must understand that the only cure for bitterness is two things. Love and forgiveness. But love overall because in love, there is forgiveness. So you need the love of God. Because in love, there is forgiveness. You can't have love without forgiveness. 
Okay? God give, forgives us out of love. Out of love. Bitterness is focused on what has been done to you. To break up bitterness, you must be willing to look at what you have done to others. Ha! Ah, ah. Ha! Come on here. Come on here. See, we know we lie. I put in Facebook one time, we love to take the finger this way. But when we have to take it this way, ah, that's a whole nother issue. Because it's no longer I, but it's me or oh me. Oh, Lord. See, bitterness will have you look at what others have done to you. But your task is to admit what you have done to others. How about that? And what your responsibility is in the matter. And go to those who have hurt you, that you have hurt. Ah, oh, come on here. See, we don't want to deal with that. Confess your sin and seek their forgiveness. See, we don't want to do that. Because that means that we have to admit that we are wrong. And we're not good at that. We're very good. We can admit some things. It depends on who it is. But when we want to be cured of bitterness, we got to take the finger and point it at ourselves. We got to go and, and admit to ourselves what we have done, how we contribute to the matter, the response of another person. Okay, they didn't just up and become that way. There's a response. There's something that, as they say, it takes to, oh, yeah, we got to take the what? What does the Bible tell us to do? To take the speck before we can worry about taking the speck out of a friend's eye. We have to take the log and out of our own. How do we do that? <clears throat> How do we do that? The Bible in Matthew 7, 3 and 5 says this. Let me help you get rid of that speck in your eye. When you can't see past the log in your own eye, you become what to God as a hypocrite. First, get rid of the log from your own eye. Then perhaps you'll see well enough to get rid of the speck in your friend's eye. Some of us, mm, some of us, mm, some of us are so busy cleaning out the eyes of someone else when we haven't dealt with what is in our own eye. Okay? We need to deal with ourselves. So before 2020 comes in, I suggest we all take these next five days of grace because that's what's left. Five days of grace. Oh, I love it. I love it, Lord. Speak Holy Ghost. Five days of grace and use those five days of grace to say, examine my heart, help me forgive. And if I have to get anything right, help me get it right. Because I want to come into 2020 not looking for just a blessing, not looking for a vision, not looking to be prosperous, not looking for money in the bank, you know, because that's what the new hype is. I'm going to be prosperous in 2020. If you are, you are, you're not, you're not. But the point is, I want to be prosperous in 2020, but my first set of prosperity should start with my heart. I want my heart to be prosperous. I want my heart to be clean because having a clean heart is priority. See, I can be prosperous and still have a heart of wickedness and a heart of bitterness and a heart unforgiving. And that stuff will leak into my prosperity. I want the money or whatever it is God has for me to come into clean hands that have a clean heart. Let us get this right for real. We got five days of grace. And I, I, I'm going to say, and I challenge everyone who tunes in now and will tune in later to get their heart clean in five days of grace. Five days of grace. I'm going to say it again. Five days of grace. The examination begins right here at home. Start with yourself. Seek God's help in revealing the contents of your own heart in relationship to how you have sinned against others. We are so focused on what someone has done to us that we do not look at how what we have done to others. See, we don't want to look at our own faults and our own shortcomings and our own sins. We want to point the finger always at somebody else. We need to say this scripture in Psalms 139 and 23 to 24. Search me, O Lord, and know my heart. Test me and know my thoughts. Point out anything in me that offends you, God, and lead me along the path of everlasting life. That is the prayer. Memorize that verse for the next five days. Psalms 139, 23 to 34. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my thoughts. 
point out anything in me that offends you and lead me along the path of everlasting life. There needs to be a willingness on your part to forsake your sin of bitterness. There has to be a willingness on your part to do that. Get rid of all bitterness, rage, anger, harsh words, slander, as well as all types of malice behavior, and be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ forgave you. Ephesians 4, 31 and 32. I'm hyped up now. I don't work myself up into a frenzy because we, you know, bitterness is like depression and other emotional stress. Bitterness and resentment can uh, aggravate or cause physical problems such as arthritis. You can be affected mentally, spiritually, and otherwise. Your relationships will always suffer. God can free you from this sin. It is an oppressive and destructive emotion having its root in hate which is likened to murder. You must repent. No one can have peace and real happiness with such emotions tearing at them. If you do not, if you have not done so, ask God to forgive you and come into your life right now. He can deliver us from anything. Before I leave, let us have a prayer. I want you to pray with me as you're listening even now. Father, I acknowledge that I have held resentment and bitterness against and you fill in the blank. I don't have to fill in the blank. Call out their name. Father, I acknowledge that I've held resentment and bitterness against and put all the names that you can think of. And I confess this as sin and ask you to forgive me. I forgive. Now, put all the names of the people that you can that God drops into your mind right now, right now, right now. Come on. I know God is speaking to some of you tonight. Remind me, Lord, to not hold any more resentment, but rather to love this person. Father, I ask you to also forgive and fill in the blank. Okay? So I left you with three blanks here. Father, I acknowledge that I've held resentment and bitterness against fill in the names. I confess this sin and ask you to forgive me. I forgive, fill in the blank. Remind me, Lord, to not hold any more resentment, but rather to love this person. Father, I ask you to also forgive and fill in the blank. Okay? For the five days of grace, starting tonight, I am I, I challenge you to let God deal with your heart, to let God show you your heart, to let God clean your heart. Let God help you with those unforgiving um, people, those people that you have not been forgiving to. And also, let God tell you who to go and ask for forgiveness from. Okay? That's the harder challenge. I think that's, that's easy to sit up in my room or to sit up in the kitchen or sit up in the living room or sit up anywhere and say, Lord, um, I know I did wrong to such and such. Lord, forgive me for what I did or what I said or what I've done to such and such. It's much harder to go face to face with someone. It is, especially if you can. Especially if they're still living. These times ahead, we need to make sure our slates are clean. Every day we go out in these streets and every time we turn on the TV, every time we hear about lives uh, 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 being taken, we no longer can afford to be in a position of having an unloving spirit and unclean heart with dirty hands. Let's enter into 2020 clean. Let's enter into 2020 clean. And I don't care how many celebrations we go to, how well the meal has been prepared and how much food you endured and how many wonderful gifts you got. If your heart ain't clean, it won't even matter. It won't even matter with God because God is not going to consider your new 
your new TV. He is not going to consider your new home, your new car, your new this. He's going to look at your heart. He's not looking in your apartment. He's not looking at how beautiful your Christmas tree was. He's not looking at the food you prepared and how well your macaroni and cheese was or how good your ham or whatever it was that you had. He's not looking at your New Year's Eve outfit. He's looking at your heart. No other person knows your heart. And you need to let God reveal it to you. I appreciate you all for tuning in tonight. I pray that you will go back and catch the replay and share it. Consider having watch parties, whatever God leads you to do. Because he wants others to hear this message and leave out of 20, out of 2019 with, uh, with, with all their issues dealt with, their, with their unforgiveness and, and their bitter roots and their resentments and angers, all and malices dealt with. He wants us to come into this calendar year, 2020, clean hands and heart. Thank you again for Tea Talk Thursday. This is our last Tea Talk for this year. We'll be coming back in 2020. Where God will lead us and what the topics will be, we'll never know until God puts it on our heart. Amen. And we will do so. I also want to you invite you into what's coming into 2020. And 2020 in March, the 27th through the 29th, will be our first premiere of the play, Who Is My Neighbor? And it has been, it's under Dove Star Productions. We have a wonderful cast. We will be giving more information coming into the new year as to where you can purchase tickets and um, the ticket costs. And so we look forward to all that God is going to bring to you in 2020. But most of all, that you're going to end the 2019 positioned and postured for what is coming in the 2020. That's what this is about. Positioning and posturing you in the right areas, which is the heart for 2020. You have a blessed evening. Have a safe and happy new year. And to some of you, a good night. Bye.